All right, everybody, and we're back. Let's see. Uh, housekeeping note: uh, This on your week one on Blackboard. Obviously, I'm putting these YouTube things below it. And what I did add to the, uh, I will I tend to use this this Nestor PowerPoint three sometimes for illustrations as well as the other and then these additional notes that i threw in on bacteria that you can see here and what i did was i downloaded that and opened it and you can and basically it starts around here most of this is lab up until then and it really is comes from the nestor textbook and basically all that you're seeing here these different groupings and well it sort of gives you some useful how should i say it uh, you know, just some useful background information, some definitions and things along that a line. It does movement across membranes, which you're familiar with. When you get to the cell wall stuff, it becomes very important. And we really will spend a lot of time on that and that type of thing. I think I take it all the way up with gel air structures. And it's not going to be in the same order in plasma. So all of that's really important material. So I thought I would just show it to you having outlined it a little bit for you, though it doesn't necessarily follow what we're going to be doing today. And what we're doing today, having effectively finished everything that really was relevant to covering in the first chapter, is to move on to what they call chapter three. It's really uh, when we talk about prokarya and eukarya from a microscopic aspect, that's three and four, which we'll be doing uh, sort of combined together. And so what I have up here is this one chapter three, which is really bacteria and, and really archaea, just just mentioning it in passing, there's not a lot to say about it from our perspective. So that's that's kind of where we're going with all this. Make sure I've done this a couple of times. This is really a okay. So we are recording and everything looks good. Oh, the cat. Hey, it's important. I wish you dog pictures. I had to show the cat. We gave the dog a bath and the cat then the next day jumps in there. It's like, well, what about me? The other cat, no, but this cat, yes. Okay. We're, yeah, we're going to talk about the bacterial anatomy. Uh, that, that's kind of silly. There's so many different things, cell walls, you know, cell, cell membranes, DNA, RNA, the shapes we'll look at, uh, the terms that describe the arrangements we'll look at, because that's important as well. Did, one of the points of emphasis, certainly, even though they put it on this particular little overview, is the idea of the distinction, because a lot of the questions I phrase test-wise are in bacteria this or in eukarya that. So you have to know the difference between the two groupings because they're, they're very, very much different. One's, a, you know, one's like our cells and the other one are a totally different uh, kind of cellular form. The cell wall, extraordinarily important. The concept of lacking membrane bound organelles. So exactly what organelles are in there are all part of it. And then this is where they start to get into what they're talking about just they're a living thing they've got a cytoplasmic membrane they have cytoplasm it's similar to our cytoplasm not identical it certainly has the same degree of osmolarity to it so the same uh, proportion of solvents of solutes to solvents are there even though the sol solutes are different they're a water-based system so that's the universal solvent for them and that's why the nugget on movement across membranes is so important it really is. And when we get to methods of control, it's really important. And the distinction is the cell wall. So I'll throw that out there. Now, we, what, what we see with bacteria, what affects them much more is drying and salting and things like that, that pull fluid out. Because what that does is it pulls the cell membrane away from the cell wall assembly. And what you'll remember, what I said before, is it's an envelope. It's a really good term to describe it. And when you separate them, the membrane ruptures, and that's it for the bacteria. Now it's, now it's not going to go anywhere. The flip side of that is water, just like a plant. It's very hard to overhydrate a bacteria. So we can't kill them by water. How do we control them with water? When we wash our hands, it's really mechanical action. It's the water moving away the materials that are there. 
Okay. To me, that's what water does much as I, the soap assists to some extent. You're going to see the soap depending on the experiments you do in lab. I do one with hand washing, which I think is good. I don't know if everybody's going to do that because you have, I mean, you have the instructors, you know, Dr. Stress and Dr. Hilwig, uh, Dr. Stress and Hilwig would be appropriate way to say that. They do whatever they want to do. I mean, I've, I've, I've given them both all the different labs that I do. They can do what they want. <laughs> They're smarter than I am. They're entitled. Okay. So that's all part of it. But I mean, I really, what you're going to see when it comes to understanding about bacteria, what's very effective, and we use it all the time when we get to methods of control, dehydrating it, drying it, salting it, pulling the water out. Overhydrating doesn't do anything for it. That's because that cell wall restricts the rupturing. And that's very much what's true with plants, it's true with bacteria, even though they're certainly not the same. Ribosomes, we're going to focus on the 70S. The cytoskeleton, as compared to eukaryotic cells, totally different. It's years ago, we used to think that this bacterial cell was kind of like you, you went to Giant Eagle and you got a plastic bag and you just kind of tossed everything in there and you, you took it out with you. There was very little work. We know there's a certain amount of organization there now, as we've improved with microscopy and more elaborate techniques. It's not nearly as advanced. And you all did A&P and you all know about all of that cell with the microtubules and the microfilaments and the intermediate, this whole elaborate infrastructure within the confines of the cell. So, I mean, there's really a lot that goes on with that particular when we get to the eukaryotic cell, but it, and it, nowadays we know there's a little bit more when it comes to the cytoskeleton and really a lot about the chromosome and particularly about the plasma. The cell wall is pretty much there. There are a few that do not have a really well-developed cell wall. And what happens to them is they tend to respond sort of irregularly to the environment. They find do funny shapes and it's not as, so they have other things in the membrane that kind of holds it together. Typically what we utilize in our cells, and you might remember this from A&P, we utilize in all eukaryotic cells, utilize some kind of sterol, a fat that's within the cell membrane. So in ours, it's very easy. We use cholesterol. In fungi, they use ergosterol. But when we use the term sterols, it's a generic term for a fatty molecule. And certain bacteria employ this. Most notably, the one you're going to encounter from a clinical perspective is called mycoplasma. You've got to watch out for the names. There's another one called mycobacteria. It's totally different and very important. Mycoplasma, very different. It doesn't have a defined shape. It's got a fancy term we call Pleomorph. And what pleomorph means just many shapes. And depending on the environment, atmospheric pressure that it's in, it can look round, it can look flat, it can have little tentacles, doesn't matter. Funny shapes. Why is it significant? Because it's a particular, actually, interestingly enough, there's a relatively infrequent sexually transmitted disease, but the one that we see the most of is about the third most common type of pneumonia called mycoplasma pneumonia. And that's really the name of the organism, okay? And it's called walking pneumonia. And what is it most commonly seen in? We got a name for walking pneumonia because we saw it in close living conditions like military barracks, and they were still able to train and drill, but we see a lot in college students, interestingly enough. So a lot of times you'll get a diagnosis, and someone you know, or perhaps you, will get a diagnosis of pneumonia. It doesn't mean, oh, my God, it's COVID. Okay, a lot of times it's just sort of a lingering thing that lasts for a couple of you're not You're sick, but you're not that sick. And you're coughing, but you're not like, oh, my God, I can't move. So you're able to function, and but you do have to treat with antibiotics, which we will get to as time goes on. So they mostly have a cell wall, and they typically have, extending from the surface, this interesting sugar shell, which is what glycocalyx mean, and that is exactly what we have in our cells that provide so much identity. What many of you will get this term in AP2, you're talking about tiny little groups of sugars that protrude from cells, particularly red blood cells. That's the foundation of ABO blood groups. 
what we collectively call blood typing, which is a combination of the ABO and the plus and the minus. And you'll get to that in the blood unit. What's it based on? Little short chains of sugars that come out. So they play a very important role in cell recognition. Okay. It's what your immune system responds to if it's not what's supposed to be there to anticipate it. Some, but not all, bacterial cells possess, by the way, they phrase that. You know, some got it, some don't. Okay. These appendages, they are very much different than the appendages. When we talk about flagella in our eukaryotic cells, the only one it has is the male is the sperm cell. That's an internal protein appendage, meaning it just protrudes, but it's sheathed in part of the membrane. A very thin layer of membrane surrounds it. So the protein's in the cell. This is more like a hair. It sticks out. So, and they're based on length. Flagella are long. They have a great deal to do with the cell moving around. Basically, the way bacteria, not all of them have it. So some bacteria are what we call non-modal. Motility or movement is one of the ways we categorize bacteria. So the more, let's say, a flagella, the busier they are moving around. So they have a tendency to swarm. That's something you will probably see in the lab when you work with a very interesting bacteria that swarms and does cause disease, even though it's relatively normal in our GI tract called Proteus vulgaris. But because it swarms and it moves around, and, and what you're going to find out is the gut bacteria have a nasty habit of causing urinary tract infections, particularly so in women, based on the anatomy that's there. And so it's one of the, that and E. coli, which is also a bacteria that moves around because it has a flagella, uh, have a tendency to be the most common culprits in most urinary tract, the typical bacterial cystitis or urinary tract infection, which is stuff that we'll deal with down the road, but that's sort of just set in the frame for it. So you've got flagella, long, and they're, again, they're like hairs that protrude. They're not sheathed in membrane. So they're extracellular protein appendages, and they're not made of the same stuff. We'll get to that. Our flagella are made of microtubules and eukaryotic cells. These are made by a particular protein that's assembled. And they, and they couldn't come up with a clever name, so they call it flagellin. But it's okay. I didn't make it up. Pili, the protein, are a little shorter. They're made of something called pilin. And fimbriate, it's not made of fimbrian. I don't know what it's made out of. But they're like, they're like little bristles. And they have a lot to do with attachment. Pili, we're going to see, are pretty important, particularly the so-called sex or fertility pills. <clears throat> Outer membrane. That's limited. We're going to focus on that when we get to gram-negative and gram-positive. The single most important distinction in bacteria is the assembly of their cell wall. They basically, with very limited exceptions, fall into two categories, gram-positive and gram-negative. You can't paint with a broad brush with diseases. Oh, one's harder, one's makes you sicker. No, doesn't work that way. There are some members that are innocuous and some members that are deadly. <coughs> the distinction, as you will see, is really the focus point to me of this chapter. They have a totally different cell wall anatomy. The outer membrane is a real oddball. And you're going to see it's something that is what we, and again, we use the term unique. When you use the term unique in biology, it means nothing else has it. Peptidoglycan is unique to bacteria. No other living things have it. The outer membrane of the gram negative has an outer layer called the LPS, which you're going to see, and we're going to get to it in detail, called the lipopolysaccharide layer. Nothing else in nature's got it. Okay. Anytime you have one of those, teachers live for those questions. That's our favorite question. Okay. It sets things apart. Okay. okay. Just, you're just all looking at me like, why am I here? We just had a Monday off and now I'm stuck with you again on a Wednesday and you're making noise. It's okay. Since I haven't done this in three days, I'm all full of, of, of energy. I have no idea what a nanowire or a nanotube is. It's a new one on me. Okay. Nano means extraordinarily small. Okay. So we'll, 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 we'll learn about that together. Plasmids, very important. That's the little nugget about genetic engineering that can move from bacteria to bacteria. Inclusions are used mostly for identification. 
bacteria don't store a lot of stuff. Sometimes they're nutrients, sometimes the particles have other relevance, and we use them mostly in the lab for identification. The same thing as you'll see for flagella. Flagella are uh, really, we, even though we, the more you have them, the more it moves, okay, but by and large, they're for identification in the laboratory. I don't stain for them, and I mostly look at prepared slides because the staining is somewhat noxious. And you got to be careful with some of those stains, environmentally speaking, you use them under the hood, things like that. Endospores, really important. That was the whole nugget with all those clostridia that I put up there with tetanus and botulism and C. diff. Endospores are effectively indestructible, very limited, okay, in the sense that bacteria can make them very important because of their in, they're very, extraordinarily hard to kill. And really, again, the definition of sterilization, which we get to as an important part of this course, is the destruction of all forms of microbial life, including bacterial endospores. You get the endospores, basically everything else is gone. We'll get to the exclusive micro compartments. There is some organization. And yeah, most of these are observed in the archaea as well. But again, we don't study that because they're, they're too hard to find. We have to recreate these uh, extraordinary environmental extreme conditions is just not feasible in those laboratories to be able to do it. Yeah, I, that's another one of those, I got to get up there and look at it type of slides. So we, we, we'll do the components. They've, all, they've had this illustration in this particular textbook for entirely too long. And for me, I don't know how to blow it up and make it more put cytoplasmic membrane we're going to look at. If you ran into this on a dark night in an alleyway, you would be afraid. I'd be scared. As long as my wife is with me, I wouldn't be scared because she's talking about it. The bacteria, so you have a cytoplasmic membrane. I'm not even following the color, but it envelops it. You can see the genetic material. It's interesting what they call the nucleoid. The OID suffix means looks like but really isn't. And what it is, there's no membrane. You can see all the chromosome material kind of there. Very, very neatly. And I should have an animation to show you. It's called supercoiling. Supercoiling is really the way it sort of condenses itself very, very neatly into a row. Because there's a lot of genes. Like you and I, typically genetic loci, locations for genes in our cells, we've got, depending on who you read, 30 to 50,000. Now, bacteria like E. coli have about 3,000. That is one-tenth. And Lord knows it's not one-tenth as big as we are. So there's a lot of genetic information sort of <clears throat> scrunched in, if you will, into this. Ribosomes, you can see they're scattered. There's no, there's no, these are all, by definition, free ribosomes. Again, bound ribosomes have to have membranes to attach it. There's no internal membrane that's there. Cytoplasm is very generic. Down here... Oh, these nano things. Let me get up close and personal. I can't even read that. All right, so I'll skip that. I can't read it. S layer around Fimbriae. We can talk about these tiny hair like projections, very much for attachment. The outer membrane we'll get to in the gram negative. Cell wall, very, very interesting. We're going to see that there's peptidoglycan, not much of a cytoskeleton. Pilus, as you're going to see, particularly what's called the sex or fertility pilus, is a hollow appendage that's shorter than a flagella, but longer than a fimbriae, and that's how genetic material is transferred. Glycocalyx, and we'll look at the different arrangements, and everything else, these inclusion bodies, very, very, very... Um, not all cells have them, not all bacteria have them that are there. Uh, little compartmentalization is not unusual. Plasmids, most of them have. And again, the flagellum is by no means something that's essential, but we'll go over all of those. So I wanted to go kind of touch on that. I really have to look at these nanotubules and nanowires. Who knew? Most of them can function either independently or in groups. Okay, it varies. The grouping of bacteria 
you're going to see very, very interesting when we start to get into these, what they call slime layers. Okay. These multicellular associations, the classic one we all have inside of us on our mouth. Okay. Dental talk. That's a multicellular association and its properties are based on multiple bacteria. The ones that are against your teeth, Okay, against the enamel are actually shielded from oxygen. So they're anaerobic and they can live when there's, even though you're breathing and oxygen is getting in there, it's shielded. The ones that are on the exterior are aerobic because they can function with all the air that's moving in and out. Interestingly, those anaerobic ones sort of create the ability for certain other kinds of bacteria to break down the enamel and create defects, which you and I call cavities. So, the dental tartar functions to really create the environment that allows other bacteria to do their damage. That are there. So the, and, and slime layers are a big deal, particularly today when we started looking at genetic engineering and some of the environmental uses, being able to either destroy those layers or to utilize them to you know, this is sort of how they treat oil spills. So the bacteria will surround it and envelop it by creating these associations. It's interesting. So those are colonies or biofilms. Communications, and it's interesting as we begin to look at what these can do, that if they're calling those nanotubes, they didn't really have a name, but there was just the ability for these multicellular associations to communicate with one another. They typically have the size of about a micron. For context, when you look under a microscope and look at a red blood cell, maybe that's got a diameter of seven microns or so. So some of, and I think indeed they may be a little bit smaller. Cocci, which you will see are spherical forms. So two-dimensionally on a board, they're going to look like a circle, but they're really spherical and they're very, very common. Rods a little bit longer and rods vary. You're going to see we have rods that are very elongated rods that are sort of what we call them cocobacilli because they're sort of short rounded but they're still technically speaking rods and that's part of the classification that's involved and here are those pleomorphs variation in cellular structure genetic nutritional differences environmental factors etc voila so most of the time you might be look at perfect spheres sometimes they'll be maybe a little offset circularly in lab, you'll be able to identify these. For instance, the classic cocci that you're going to see, things like this, this photo of staphylo. What does staphylo mean? A cluster. Why does it form this way? Because it, again, bacteria, all they do is divide in two. These divide in two in a very random fashion. They're not within particular planes or very ge geometrically organized. So what they tend to form, at least microscopically, is what appear to be grape-like clusters. Like you went to Giant Eagle and you got a bunch of grapes. Okay. So we see that. Okay. So it's a cell is spherical or ball-shaped. We call it a coccus is how you pronounce it. Cocci is the plural. And they can have, and there's different nuances for those who go into the lab is a way that they can be identified them. Like I've been looking at them for a long time, to say the least. And so a lot of times I can look at a particular slide and say, aha, that's Staphylococcus or that's Streptococcus. Streptococci are bigger than Staphylococcus and they have a totally different arrangement. It's not my looking at them is not diagnostic, but from experience, you get an idea. And that's what folks in the lab get a pretty good idea about things like that. Where bacillus, and now there's a big difference. When I talked about Koch's work and him studying anthrax, okay, this was the name of anthrax, Bacillus anthracis. Remember, when you do binomial nomenclature by death by convention, the genus, the first letter is capitalized. When we write Bacillus this way, that's a generic term for a rod shaped bacteria. So that's another one of those little things when you're taking a test. Somebody, I generally won't do stuff like that. Unless I really don't like you. 
for your test, you're going to have, I'll put it in. For everybody else's, I won't. But term, as you can see, the genus versus that. When you use the small b, we're talking about shape. When you use the big b, we're talking about genus. Okay. They can be blocky, spindle-shaped, round-ended, long and thread lice, even club-shaped. Okay. So this uh, Legionella pneumophilia. That's just in that photo. So I guess you would call that more elongated. What's famous about Legionella pneumophilia? Don't implicate me because I was there when it was first discovered, when it was first talked about. Legionnaire's disease. Okay? Legionnaire's disease. And we do it, we, we look at this in respiratory disease, but I'll give you the backstory. At the time of the bicentennial in 1976 in Philadelphia, they had a big convention of veterans. A lot were World War I, certainly. Even some were surviving then because they would have been basically close to 80. And a lot of World War II and Korean veterans all gathered in this hotel in a very charming area called Rittenhouse Square in Center City, Philadelphia. That hotel was the Bellevue Stratford. We used to have meetings there in our, forgive me, honor society. Just go ahead. Try, I'm straining myself, patting myself on the back. You gotta do that. Okay. So typically when, if you go to a convention, they have a big set of rooms and you're constantly in those rooms and they partition them. They're wide open. If you have somebody giving a lecture or a talk and they cone them down, if you're having dinner there or they bring in more partitions, whatever. And what these, what these veterans had was two things in common. They all smoke and they all drink to excess. And what happened, there was a bacteria that was in, that developed in older buildings that were grandfathered in before code, which is very different than the buildings today. The buildings today, you have water lines, you have power lines, you have ventilation lines that are all separate. Here they had those big old crawl spaces you might see in an old movie. And what happened, it was the combination of leaky old pipes and dusty areas that were in these crawl spaces and it allowed a particular bacteria that was very common to flourish. This is the bacteria. And what it did in susceptible populations, read that in people who had other comorbidities, drinking, smoking, older, etc. In a, in a confined space, they developed this particular interesting kind of pneumonia. We'll talk more about it. What they thought, God, they thought that had somebody that all of a sudden when these terrible flus, like the Spanish flu, had come back to bite us. That was a lot of what they thought with COVID, what they call a novel virus, had come back. So they put the leading authority on viruses in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, Dr. Jay Satz, who was my virology instructor in school, on it. And he couldn't find the virus because it wasn't a virus. They found out it was a bacteria. Interesting story. It's like an I was there. I, what is that? Forrest Gump was always there. I think I was there for a lot of these things, but I wasn't nearly as famous. Okay. A lot of people think I caused it. So the other bacterial shape are curved or spiral shapes. So Vibrio looks like a comma. This is one I have no idea what it is. Vibrio vulnificus. The most famous Vibrio of all causes a disease called cholera. And it's found in contaminated water. Vibrio cholera, a very, very deadly disease. We frequently see in war-torn areas and natural disasters because it occurs. It's when which when fecal material goes into water supplies and contaminates it. Spiral forms. This is called Campy, Campylobacter jejuni. It tells you where it's located in the jejunum. This is another one for foodborne illnesses. Spiral, you can see the little flagella at the ends that are there. And then very, very famously, spirochetes. Spirochetes are really corkscrew-like, and they very, very much look like this. And surely the two most famous spirochetes, okay, Treponema pallidum, which causes syphilis, and the other one has got a great name, Borrelia burgdorferi. And you've all know somebody who's been affected by that because it causes Lyme disease. 
see all the fun you're going to have. These are interesting, these little filamentous. They actually replicated the tips. So they look like little spores. This is called streptomyces. Most of the antibiotics that we use very commonly that don't come from penicillin or its cousin come from this guy, streptomyces. The z pack for instance, comes from cousins of this streptomyces. So we look at the arrangement of all of these as part of the way this is how we recognize them. The whole ball game when it comes to taking care of somebody with an infection is you got to find out what causes it. Okay. So we have to, it's like Coke in his postulates. You've got to be able to grow it in pure culture. We can't tell what antibiotic to use, what the disease is until we identify it. Whether it's from the sputum, whether it's from the skin, whether it's in the blood, wherever it is. And so this is part of it. So the cocci, are they single? Are they in pairs? Are they in groups of four? Are they in clusters? Staphylococci. Are they in chains? The term strepto means chains. And this is called sarcina, which are packets, which we really don't have a lot of relevance. The ones that have the big relevance are pairs and chains. And that's something that's very common with streptococci or other kinds of diplococci and staphylococci and micrococci are both significant. So when they divide in one plane, they typically either form pairs. What's very, very famous in the world where of diplococci is a variation of streptococci called diplococcus pneumonia, sometimes called streptococcus pneumonia, the leading cause of bacterial pneumonia. The other diplococci comes under the category of what are called Neisseria species. They're gram negative, not gram positive. Neisseria meningitides, the leading cause in adults of bacterial meningitis, or Neisseria gonorrhea, one of the most famous of all sexually transmitted diseases. Here are streptococci, short chains. And now the, the packets are tetrads. You don't see a lot of, but the clusters you certainly do, staphylococci and micrococci. On your skin, all of us, we have staphylococci. We have some streptococci. We have something interesting that you work with in the lab. It's found in the soil called pseudomonas. We have a yeast that's there that's got one of my favorite names. Malassezia furfur. Yeasts have great, yeast and fungi have great names. And that one actually causes a very interesting fungal disease on the skin, which isn't significant. It's cosmetic called uh, tinea, which is, the, which is the name that we give. Tinea pettis is the athlete's foot. Okay, for instance. So tinea means a surface skin infection with fungi. This one's called tinea versicolor. Because it forms, when you examine it with an ultraviolet examining light, it has multiple colors. Ultraviolet examining lights are very useful in dermatology because certain things glow. It's one of the ways. I had one in my office. So it's like we turn off the lights in the office, have a little magnifying light. You flip the switch. You got one frequency of ultraviolet to make things for fresh. So it wasn't dangerous, obviously, to somebody looking at it. Like it would be if you didn't have eye protection and you were going in in a tanning bed for whatever reason, like my daughter. Hey, what are you up to? Don't, I can't talk, Dad. I'm tanning. <clears throat> Here's another one. These are called palisades. Carinibacterium. Carinibacterium is we harbor a great many in our bodies. They're a gram-positive rod that doesn't form endospores but they're called palisading because they sort of randomly go in different kinds of planes, but they stay somewhat attached. Okay. So they're, they're kind of interesting. And you're going to see in the lab, you're going to see chains of bacilli. Something you, we, we work with in the lab because bacillus subtilis has that. So the, it, so the appearance is that, and there's different things, you know, you know the, the oddballs that are there. And so what are possessed by some, well, they all have ribosomes, a cell membrane and chromosomes, flagella vary. Okay. Well, we, we'll get to that. Flagella, motility. 
flagella are different. Most of the time they protrude in those spiral forms. They're called axial filaments. They're actually inside the bacteria and they kind of twist and that allows them to move. They're quite modal. Okay. They move around quite a bit, particularly those spirochetes and it's sort of like twisting motion that does that. And you'll be, and again, different kind of attachment points that are in there. So when we look at this, they have a very, very distinct arrangement. To me, I don't get too excited about it. They have a way that it attaches inside called the basal body, whether it's gram positive or gram negative, not a big deal to us. A hook area where it sheathed it and what protrudes is the filament. So you'll see this. And to me, it's not a big deal. Okay. How it's arranged or anything like that. I'm just interested in the fact that it's a flagella, we'll get to this being a gram negative cell. How do we know this? Because it's got an inner membrane, the regular cytoplasmic membrane, the peptidoglycans in the middle sort of sandwiched and it has an outer membrane, but we'll get to all of that. But the arrangements, there are four major ways. And again, we use those for identification. The most common arrangement is at the end. It's called a polar. So most of the time we see a single polar flagellum. Okay. And they do move around quite a bit. Okay. And usually when we see animations or representations, this is what they'll look like. And this is called monotrichus because they look like a hair. So the trichus is something we use for hair. Okay. Lophotrichus bunches or bundles at one end or another. And sometimes they'll be at both ends. They're called amphitrichus. And again, the ones that are randomly all the way around peritrichus. So those are four names I would know for the arrangement. They show you some examples. Monotrichus. This is, it's hard to tell. This would be a bundle that lophotrichus. I'm not quite sure. They, I've seen better illustrations of it. What do they do? Basically, chemicals are the most common ways that induce motion in bacteria. So it's called chemotaxis. It's very simple. It's a lot different than you and I with regard to different chemicals. We use chemicals in our bodies all the time. Okay. That induce that attach to receptors. They call it, whether it's insulin with a multitude of things or human growth hormone, pick something. Okay. The way you're what you, when you get to the immune system in AP2, what happens when tissue is damaged? It releases chemicals. Those chemicals send signals to the bloodstream. The little capillaries open up. It allows white blood cells to leave. They're attracted to that area of damage by chemotaxis. Mostly it's, 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 I love this. It's like they were on prices, right? Come on down. I can just hear it. There's an injury. Come on down. We need you. Come to the party. Okay. So it's not, they don't know where they're going. They don't have eyes. They're cells. Same thing with bacteria, but bacteria, it's even simpler. They're either attracted or repelled. So you have positive chemotaxis moving toward the chemical stimulus or negative chemotaxis. They're being repelled. I'm either going there or I'm not going there. Okay. Our cells have a fair amount of energy production. So they basically will go very much straight line or pretty much to the area relatively quickly. Bacteria have limited capabilities of producing energy. They do something called run, tumble, run. So they'll go towards something with the energy they have. And all of a sudden they'll go, Oh, my tired. And they basically will tumble. And then they'll run then they'll tumble. They'll get there eventually. It just takes a little while longer. Okay. So it's not just necessarily a straight line. If they have something that's attracted or repelling, okay, they will go towards it while they have energy. Then they will tumble and then they will do another run and eventually they'll get there. So a lot of times what you'll see is described as brownie in motion. It's just some organisms move all the time, but they don't have an attractant or repellent by and large. So they're going to go from point A. Well, you and I would just go from point A to point B. 
They'll run, they'll tumble, they'll run, they'll tumble, they'll run. Eventually, they'll get to you. Be patient. They're getting there. Just say. Spirochetes, regally mode of locomotion because of these sort of coiled axial filaments within what you will see here is called the periplasm. Okay, so they're internally located in the space between the cell wall and the cell membrane. It's a good way to describe it. So as they begin to move like this, they cause a certain amount of motion in the organism. And then when it comes to attachment or even formation of certain openings, we have fimbriae, little bristles. Okay, a lot of bacteria have fimbriae. Okay. And depending if they're in one of these large colonies, they will attach to one another. The best way that you, it's sort of like you go walking in the fall and you have a sweater on, you get those things that stick to it. That's kind of like what a fimbria is. I would, I would look at it. Pili, pilus being the singular, the big deal for them, okay, conjugation. We will get to that in length when we look at the genetic aspect of things. This is very, very well described. And for years, we used to think it was only in gram negative cells. They are in both. Both have the ability to conjugate. So they categorized it was called a type four pilus transferring genetic material, but they can also act like a fimbriae for attachment, et cetera, or even like a flagella and motility. But the one we'll deal with the most is the so-called F, or for, which stands for fertility, or what they call the sex pilus. They used to think that this was some kind of a, like a male-female, like male bacteria had one in female bacteria, didn't, but they found out that that, and they, initially they thought it was sexual congress, but bacteria are asexual by definition. And these nanotubes are nanowires, the tubular extensions of cytoplasmic membrane, channels, shuttling electrons and iron-rich substances. That's very interesting. Uh, a lot of times sequestering iron is one of the ways that anciently they used to treat infections. They used to use different things in older medicine to try to limit infections. But we now know now that there's, there's, that iron does play a role iron rich substances this is the illustration where fimbria are like little bristles here's a pilus or pili between one bacteria and another and we know they're hollow and we know that genetic material in the form of these plasmids can pass okay this is what they call an s layer not a big deal for us single layers of thousands of copies of one protein okay chain link fence is a good analogy uh, this is something that they'll produce within a hostile environment. This is the big mistake that we made with antibiotics. And it's one of my focus points when we get into antibiotics and we get into genetic mutations. It was a foreign concept that these are bacteria. We have this wonderful stuff called penicillin and we can bombard them with that and it works. And then they found that it didn't work. What they didn't understand was effectively that's chemical warfare. And what happens in chemical warfare, we cause mutations and bacteria like anything, and they replicate constantly, are going to form a certain amount of genetic mutations that are going to be more favorable to survive. One of the ones that was favorable is they began to produce enzymes to combat the penicillin. When we get to it, you're going to hear it's called penicillinase. And there's different kinds of it. And what it was able to do, effectively, we saw the population of Staphylococcus aureus not once, but twice evolve. First to being, first it was all susceptible to penicillin, nearly all of it. Then it became resistant to penicillin. And then it became resistant to advanced forms or, mute, or modified, chemically modified forms of penicillin. That's what MRSA is. Methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. It's a relatively common bacteria that has evolved a couple of times. And now in the hospital, 60, 70, 80% of those infections are resistant to the common ways that we would treat it with antibiotics, even in advanced ways. In the community, it's a little bit easier to treat. In the hospital, it's a little harder to treat. 
when we get to the point where we can't treat it, we are in big trouble. And those are really what super bugs or super infections are all like. So the S layer is something, and this is just another thing that they're able to form in response to hostile environments. They want to survive just like you and I want to survive. It's cold out. We put, we put on a coat, we turn on the heat. Okay. I tie the dog out rather than take him for a walk because I am too effing cold. To be blunt. You want to go out? Go out by yourself. See if I want to go. The cat I can leave out. He'll come back. Thankfully, <clears throat> the other cat does not go out. You want to go out? Not on a bed. I am an inside cat and proud of it. I will go on the deck. You come on the deck kind of. And if you walk over there, sh scoots back in. Oh, I, I just want to be. Don't be mad at me. See, we don't have to worry about kids at home anymore. Thank goodness. The glycocalyx, the sugar shell, polysaccharides or glycoprotein, sugar and protein units, when they are loosely arranged, they are inherently sticky. And so what they do is they tend to form these slime layers or multicellular associations. So they're, it's kind of like you've got a whole group of like trying to think like a candy that's you know that's it's, it's got like sugar on the outside and it kind of sticks to your fingers there yeah. you know capsules are different they are much more organized dense and thicker units and they give it this relatively thick even waxy coat and what we see with that is a whole other you saw the term mycoplasma the most famous of these called mycobacteria and mycobacterium have a capsule where the carbohydrate is very waxy. It's called mycolic acid. It's nearly impossible to penetrate. Where do you try staining it in the lab? The one you use is called mycobacterium smegmatis, a lab, because it's relatively innocent. I mean, it's extraordinarily rare that it would cause anybody any harm. These two bad boys in the same family do. One's very famous. It's called tuberculosis. A very nasty disease that's more common again than you think. And the other one, microbacterium leprosy, which forms very, very famous biblically leprosy. We don't call it that now because the biblical connotation. Oh, you have leprosy, it's catchy, it's really not. Okay? It's been called Hansen's disease. Did you know that? They don't call it leprosy anymore because people with leprosy were shunned. Now it's called, there's one clinic in Carville, Louisiana. Treats it. I see, I've seen one case of leprosy and a soldier who on his way home from Vietnam, they sent to Africa and he contracted it there. So voila, I mean, here you can see the S layer for protection, the glycocalyx, and it depends on the organization. So a certain bacteria are encapsulated and we utilize stains to adapt and capsules are significant because like tuberculosis, like leprosy, your white blood cells are, they can't envelop them. They're, for lack of a better way to express it, hard to swallow. And macrophages, that's how they do this, by swallowing. Let's stop here. So this is where I, well, I'll pick that back up again. Mm -hmm.